Okay, so it's a 401. We have 72 people in the room. Maybe we should get started. So uh, it is really my greatest, the greatest pleasure to be able to have a Professor Michael Eismann from University of Michigan to give a seminar here. So um, Professor Eismann is a professor in the nuclear department and also a professor in the material science department in Michigan. And uh, so he got his bachelor degree in math and physics in Hebrew University. And he's a master and PhD in applied physics at Caltech. So Professor Asmon's research has a uh, focus on basic material science, including phase transitions and mechanical properties of nanocrystalline and amorphous metals, as well as radi radiation effect in metals. He is a um, bi fellow of Church uh, Churchill College at the U University of Cambridge, UK and also a senior fellow at the Michigan Society of Fellows. So, you know, there are a lot of really good people at Michigan and, uh, um, and I have a huge respect to Professor Asma. So uh, let me put it this way. So uh, I have been striving to become the Professor Asma at U of I. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's uh, listen to Professor's lecture on the microscopic descriptions of the plasticity of metallic glasses. Huh. Yeah, thank you, YZ, for your very kind introduction. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'll uh, first uh, begin with uh, introducing the people who contributed to this work. Uh, so there are three former PhD students, uh, as well as one undergraduate who made significant contributions to the work. He's now a graduate student uh, at Berkeley. And also we've had collaborators at the University of Cambridge and at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. Um, so I'll begin by telling you what a glass is and what a metallic glass is. Um, I'll discuss uh, for motivation what the applications are of metallic glasses and what scientific challenges we've been facing. And um, then I'll describe our work, uh, which we've been performing in the past decade. Uh, and it involves um, measuring time dependent deformation and getting a great wealth of information from uh, the experimental data uh, uh, by using experiments coupled with, with theory. Um, then uh, I'll show how we use those results to obtain further insight in how glasses uh, evolve, how their structure and uh, properties evolve. Um, so first I'll show you a demonstration that is not mine. Um, I took it uh, from YouTube. It was created at the University of Wisconsin Materials Research uh, Science and Engineering Center. And what you'll see here, each steel ball represents an atom and you'll see what happens when you cool a liquid slowly and how it solidifies. Um, and, okay, that's, let's see if it's, um, yeah, that's an unexpected glitch here. Um, I'll try one more time now, okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you what the, the clip, it's a beautiful demonstration. And basically you shake the balls uh, using the speaker, uh, feeding um, a, a, a sound, sound into it. And then, okay, I may have to exit and resume. Let me see. Um, sorry about that. It's, well, it's never happened um, before. Um, okay. Now that, all right, I'll stop sharing for a moment. Uh, sorry about that. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I'll start again and I will, um, we'll have to describe to you what those clips show. Oh, right, right off the beginning. So, so basically uh, you shake them and that simulates the, the structure. Of, oh, oh. One more step. 
Okay, hopefully that is the last glitch. Um, okay, so you shake them and then you slowly turn down the volume and they arrange uh, in a crystalline structure, which you see here. Now, if you shake them and cool abruptly, they do not arrange in a crystalline structure. They're frozen in a metastable structure, which is less dense. The curvature of the speaker uh, provides for um, uh, the, the low ener lowest energy state being the densest, and that's the crystalline structure. Um, so that's what happens when you make a, a, a glass. You freeze a liquid by cooling it sufficiently fast. So here, um, I don't know if I can... Yeah, no, I can't show you that image. So um, yeah, too bad it doesn't work. But um, the, the idea is you cool the liquid fast and it freezes in the liquid structure and uh, it doesn't have the lower energy um, crystalline structure. Okay, so now a metallic glass is a metallic alloy, which is a frozen liquid. And those were discovered uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, you can make them, for example, by squirting a molten jet of metal onto a spinning copper wheel, uh, which is at room temperature, and you get cooling rates of a million degrees per second, uh, which corresponds to um, going from the melting point to room temperature in a millisecond. Um, of course, this imposes a limit on the thickness because you cannot remove heat fast enough from a thicker object. Um, and now later, uh, chemical compositions uh, were identified that don't require high cooling rate. Uh, and that made possible the formation of bulk metallic glasses and now structural applications are possible. And I'll show you some applications. Uh, and so here again from the University of the Wisconsin uh, is a demonstration, um, which I will not try. I don't want uh, PowerPoint to freeze again. But basically there are two steel balls. One bounces on stainless steel, the other one bounces on a metallic glass. And um, on the stainless steel, it bounces twice and loses all its energy. Uh, on the metallic glass, it goes on and on. It doesn't lose much energy. So this is a good spring material. What does it mean that it's a good spring material? Oh, there it is. Okay. Perfect. So it worked here, wonderful. Um, so let's look at a plot of strength versus elastic limit, which means how much can you stretch the material before it deforms permanently or fail, fails? Um, and what you see is steels are strong but have a low elastic limit. Polymers uh, display the opposite. Metallic glasses have both high strength and high elastic limit. So that's why you can store a large amount of elastic energy in them. Where is that useful? Um, in structural applications, for example, in sporting goods, but also casings for electronics and, and other, and I'll show you some pictures of uh, applications. Earlier on, before bulk metallic glasses, um, some of them have soft magnetic properties, which means you can use them for low loss transformer cores. Now, considering that all the electricity we consume uh, goes through transformers, the potential for energy savings uh, is enormous. And um, then also magnetic sensors and transducers, for example, in the old days of magnetic recording. Um, now, another advantage is that when you cool a liquid in the undercooled state, you can vary its viscosity continuously. And that, that way you can use blow molding, which normally is only used for plastic, for example, for milk jugs, uh, to make milk jugs. Um, also, the volume hardly changes, which means you can cast something in near net shape. For crystalline materials, once they freeze, they shrink and you get voids and it's a huge problem, for example, in the automotive industry. Um, and here I'll show you some applications. So here you see a, a stent designed to keep a blood vessel open. Um, this relies on the spring properties and also on corrosion resistance. And here you see a few images of miniature devices formed by casting. Uh, this is from the lab of Jan Schoyas uh, at Yale. Um, and they also uh, made metallic glasses for some more cosmetic applications. Um, and I mentioned sports applications. So the best golf clubs um, are made with metallic glasses. In fact, they perform so well that they've been banned by the Professional Golf Association. Um, now in the same lab uh, at Yale, uh, they make nano rods by thermoplastic forming. Um, and these have diameters well below one micron. Uh, so you see there's great potential for um, making small parts. 
Another very interesting application. Um, so, um, so yeah, Apple Computer has been very interested in these. It has bought a company that makes these materials. Um, and if anyone has used this tool uh, provided by Apple to remove a SIM card from a, an iPhone, uh, for a few years, uh, they make, made it out of a metallic glass uh, without even advertising it just as an experiment. Um, now, Mars Rover has been in the news just in the last couple of days. Um, well, it needs to operate at minus 200 C when lubricants freeze, so regular gear wouldn't work. But metallic glasses have very smooth surfaces and so you can use such a gear without any lubricant. Um, so that's another application. Um, so everything sounds rosy, where's the catch? So one is that um, the formation of metallic glasses, uh, permanent deformation is unstable. Um, what does it mean? Um, the exhibit work softening, which means if you deform a material and some part deforms more than the rest, it'll continue deforming until it fails. So you get catastrophic failure at shear bands. And here you see these examples. So it looks like brittle fracture. It's actually very ductile, but the ductility is confined to a submicron uh, thin layer uh, here at this interface. Um, so we, uh, we and others want to understand how they deform in order to be able to design better materials. Now, in crystalline materials, let's say you take a paper clip and bend it permanently, um, it involves atomic rearrangement. And probably the biggest contribution to understanding these rearrangements was by Sir William Bragg. What he did was he put um, an assembly of bubbles on the surface of a liquid. They formed a crystal in two dimensions. And you see various defects, including a dislocation, which is a line that ends at a point um, and you, you sometimes see something like this on corn. Um, in 3D, it would be a semi-infinite plane that ends in a line. When you shear the material, the dislocation moves. And in fact, dislocation theory is a very well-developed mathematical theory. Uh, there are textbooks about it, and it's been used, for example, to design composite materials. Um, now, our goal is to understand, to, to do something similar for metallic glasses to understand how they deform. And, um, and so I showed you that uh, the deformation of crystalline materials is accommodated by defects. Uh, our challenge is how do you identify, how do you observe a defect in a structure that's ill-defined to begin with? Um, and in fact, that was something that inspired me when I started as a graduate student, when my um, future advisor told me about work he was doing on radiation effects in um, metallic glasses and how, how to characterize defects in them. But significant progress has only been made um, later than that. Um, so our approach is a combination of experiment and theory, as you'll see. Um, so um, another piece of very important work, uh, Ali Argon at MIT um, repeated the Bragg experiment, except he mixed bubbles of different sizes. And what that does is it prevents crystallization. And we do the same in experiment when we mix alloys, uh, we mix elements of different sizes, which makes it easier to form a glass without crystallizing it when it solidifies. Um, and Ali Argon also developed, uh, oh, so before I show you what he developed, they tracked the motion of each bubble. And what they saw was that there are clusters of atoms, they're approximately spherical, which undergo shape change. Uh, they deform permanently and their environment uh, deforms uh, elastically, which means reversibly. Um, and these clusters, we call them shear transformation zones or STZs. And from now on for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about STZs. Um, and um, I should also tell you that there's a physical analog in three dimensions using a colloidal glass, which is a suspension of small plastic spheres in a liquid and you can track them as well. And the color code here is the strain and you see that it's localized in a small cluster. Um, so then Ali Argon, who also did uh, both theory and experiment, he expressed the constitutive law, namely the strain rate as a function of stress. And this is a thermally activated process. So these clusters, when they flip, there's an energy barrier for that flip. And so the, this process is thermally activated. You need a temperature fluctuation. Also, uh, here you see the stress. This is a hyperbolic sign. If the stress is small, the strain rate is linear in the stress, which means that uh, it flows uh, and it exhibits Newtonian flow. 
So I'll, I'll spend a minute discussing some of the parameters here in the equation. Um, so this is a thermally activated term. Here you see the activation free energy barrier. And if you apply stress, what you do is you tilt the potential. So you see that these clusters, they flip back and forth, but there's a bias because the barrier for going in one direction is lower than the barrier in the other direction. And that, that bias is introduced by the stress. Um, so here, this barrier, uh, the important thing to remember is that it's proportional. This is from Eshelby's theory of an inclusion in an elastic medium. Um, Omega here in red is the volume of the STZ, uh, which uh, we will obtain later results for. Um, they're various mechanical parameters, which I won't spend time on. Uh, this gamma here in blue is the transformation shear strain. So the strain which this cluster undergoes, and it's reduced somewhat by uh, the fact that this cluster is surrounded by an elastic medium. And uh, new here is the Poisson ratio of the material. Um, Another important parameter, C, um, in Argonne's theory, is that it, it's uh, the, the volume fraction of potential STZs. So these are clusters capable of undergoing a shape change. And he argued that it should be on the order of one half. So in our work, we end up getting C with very high precision and size resolved as well. Um, okay, now we go further back. Orwin, who was um, Ali Argonne's mentor, um, he made this argument uh, before the term STZ was, had been coined. Um, and uh, what he said was that at, at small strain, you have isolated STZs. The matrix is elastic. So if you remove the external force after deforming a material, the material will go back to the, its original shape. And that's what we call anelastic behavior. For example, when you squeeze an earplug and it slowly recovers its shape. So it's reversible and time dependent. Now, if you subject the material to high strain, then the volume fraction of STZs it keeps increasing as you strain the material. You lose elastic matrix, you lose back stress, and you end up with permanent deformation. So both these uh, deformation modes can be explained with the same mechanism. Uh, our experiments are all at low strain where the analysis is simple because the behavior is linear. Um, and so now one thing that is a big challenge is there's no known mechanism of imaging STZs. You can image dislocations in a crystal. There's a contrast mechanism. Um, and so information has been obtained. I showed you uh, physical analogs in 2D and 3D. Uh, you can do atomistic simulations. If you do molecular dynamics, you can only simulate a very small sample for a very short time. We do measurements over up to two years, so there's no way of simulating what we probe in our experiments. Um, and so therefore, experiments are still needed, even though sometimes there are proposal reviewers who seem not to agree with that uh, point. Um, okay, so first I'll show you conceptually what we do in our experiment. So we start with a sample, which we model as a linear solid, this is a standard mechanical engineering uh, model of the behavior of a solid. So you have a spring here. This fault unit is a spring and dash pot in parallel, like the shock absorber and spring of a car. So it's time dependent and reversible. And so what we'll do now, we first, we apply the fixed strain instantaneously and hold it. And what you see is that this, this spring responds instantaneously. And if you hold it now, Slowly, the two springs will reach equilibrium with each other and, um, and the, the strain and under fixed strain. Then it's released. And again, one spring uh, relaxes instantaneously. And here you get exponential relaxation. And the time constant is equal to the ratio of the viscosity of the dash pot to the modulus of the spring here, to the spring constant. Um, so this is what we measure in two different ways, which I'll show now. So we take a ribbon of a metallic glasses made by melt spinning, uh, which I showed earlier. Uh, it may have some curvature initially as prepared. And then we constrain it for something like two weeks and hold it um, uh, around a mandrel of known radius. And then we release it and it has a different curvature. And then we monitor the curvature as a function of time. Now, when, uh, when you bend a ribbon, you have tension on one side, compression on the other, and there's a neutral midplane. Um, that, that's if it behaves linearly, for example, elastically. 
Um, and from the curvature, you can calculate the strain, and from it, you can calculate the stress based on the modulus and Poisson's ratio, which uh, we don't need to go into uh, detail. Now, these experiments are not instrumented, so we can do them for as long as we have time and patience for, and we've done those for up to two years. Um, and here you see an example, a sample as quenched, and after constraining it for 216 hours. Now, initially, we determine the curvature by visually fitting a circle, uh, which has, uh, first, it's very tedious, and also there are error bars on these. So later, we developed a method in which we digitize the sample image and then perform a numerical fit to a circle formula. And then we obtain the radius of curvature, which with much higher degree of precision, which allows us to um, uh, obtain uh, with lower, uh, uh, smaller error bars, uh, which turn out to be very crucial to our analysis. So here you see some of the first results we obtained. So you have curves of different color. These were obtained with different mandrel radii. And this here, these numbers are the strain, the elastic strain once the sample is equilibrated under constraint. Um, and, um, and, and so you see the different elastic strain as a function of time, in this case, up to a few months. And now we can normalize the elastic strain by the equilibrium elastic strain, which is a measure of the stress and all the curves collapse into one. And what that tells us is that the processes are linear, which is good because then we can analyze them or we have tractable analysis uh, that I'll show you. Um, now, we also wanted to measure uh, faster processes. And for that purpose, uh, we used a cantilever and a nano indenter. Um, for those who are not familiar, a nano indenter is simply a tip which you move with precise measurement of displacement and force. Uh, the resolution is about one nanonewton and better than one nanometer. So it's highly, um, it has a very high precision. And from the displacement, we can calculate the strain, for example, on the surface near the clamp. Um, and so here you see an example of results obtained from a cantilever. In blue, you see uh, the load history, so the force history, high load, low load, zero, and repeat. And here you see the response, the displacement. So you see the instantaneous response, that's the elastic part, and then you see the time-dependent part, uh, which is magnified here, and that's what we analyze. Um, so what I've shown you is that there are many time constants to this problem. We cannot describe the whole process with a single time constant. Obviously, we, we, we did measurement uh, in some cases up to 10 orders of magnitude in time from uh, 10 to the minus three seconds to one year. So one exponent doesn't work. So maybe add a few exponents, but then the, and that has been done by some, then the result depends on how many exponents you use to describe the process. So what we really want is the spectrum. If you know the spectrum, you can integrate and obtain the strain as a function of time. Unfortunately, you cannot do the reverse. So there's no explicit formula that allows you to determine the spectrum F from the measurement of the strain as a function of time. So this is what mathematicians call an inverse problem. Um, so we need to solve it numerically. Before I show you that, I also want to tell you how not to analyze the data. And so um, very early on, Kolaus did measurements on capacitor discharge, and he found that it was not exponential, but he found a very convenient formula to fit. We use uh, uh, a power beta here, and it gives excellent fits. However, uh, and people use it extensively um, in the polymers field, and they attribute various properties to tau and measure its temperature dependence. Um, I'll show you why that's misguided. It, tau is not a characteristic time constant. So what I did here is very simple. I, um, a stretched exponent with a tau of 30 shifted by 10% of tau, three, and plotted here as simulated data points. And then it was fitted simply with a stretched exponent. And the tau here is 50% higher than this tau. So depending on which part of the curve you fit, you'll get a different tau. It's only a pure exponent that'll give you the same result no matter which part of it you, um, you fit. Um, so, what, what uh, the conclusion is that there are cases where uh, there's a mechanistic model for a particular process that justifies the equation. Otherwise, uh, using KWW is not uh, useful here. So what did we do instead? Um, yeah, and, and I have a warning sign that using KWW uh, is at your own risk. Um, so here we see a, 
sets of data. This is from the cantilever measurement. This is from the mandrel bending measurement. And what we did was we wrote an equation that describes uh, a linear model, but with different time constants. So we assume that uh, we, we mimic the, the, this, the spectrum with a discrete set of tau's, but a large number of them. So we have all these fault units in series, each of them corresponds to a different time constant, and they all contribute additively to the strain. And for these two different boundary conditions, in this case, it's fixed force, uh, we write the expected behavior. Uh, so the tau i are fixed, and in this case, logarithmically spaced, and those epsilon are what we fit. Those are the fitting parameters. And so here's the result. And um, it looks surprising. We were very surprised. We expected some kind of broad distribution, but we see a discrete set of peaks. And we spent many months testing these data to make sure that what we obtained was not a numerical artifact. So we used a different number of exponents. We generated simulated data by assuming a certain spectrum and testing that we could recover the assumed spectrum and it worked. So that gave us confidence that this method was reliable. And now of course, we need to understand what these different peaks mean. Um, I should also mention that the integral of a single peak, which we label with M times the equilibrium elastic strain is simply the N elastic strain corresponding to peak M. So each peak gives us, of course, a time constant, it's centroid, but also the N corresponding N elastic strain. And now um, there's a one theoretical step which allows us to obtain a wealth of information. So here's the way we model the solid. Each of these units corresponds to or is a result of the contribution of many STZs in the material, and they all contribute additively. And the effective modulus and the effective viscosity are inversely proportional to the number of units contributing. So now each STZ can occupy two states. It can flip in one direction or the other, but its time average is a continuous variable. Now, the, per, the stress term is a small perturbation, so they can, they're not just stuck in one state, but they flip back and forth and they're ergodic. They can explore the, their available states. And therefore, if they're ergodic, it means that if you take a, a snapshot and an ensemble average over all STZs, it's the same as a time average of a single STZ. And we're talking about STZs of the same type here. And this simple assumption gives us a very simple but powerful result. The integral of a single peak has a very clear physical meaning. It's the volume fraction of the solid occupied by M-type potential STZs. Okay, and again, M was the index for that particular peak. Um, so here's, uh, we obtain this from the data and we directly obtain a volume fraction without any direct microscopic observation. Um, and now if we go back to Argon's theory, we can estimate or we know all the parameters except for the volume of the STZ. And we can write his equation uh, for specific for each M, for each type of STZ, and because they contribute additively to the strain. And so we plug the numbers in and we obtain the volume corresponding to each peak in the spectrum. And here we plot that volume. Now this is an aluminum rich alloy. Um, so we normalize by the volume of a single aluminum atom. And we get, uh, we plot these data and we get a slope of one. Uh, it's quite fortuitous that it's within less than 1%. Um, what does a slope of one mean? It means that the volume difference between two STZs types corresponding to two neighboring peaks is one atom, okay? In other words, those peaks that we saw in the spectrum correspond to discrete numbers of atoms in the STZ, what we call an atomically quantized hierarchy. Um, and so what we observe is a kinetic window of STZs consisting of 14 to 21 atoms. And in fact, after we published the first paper on this, we kept performing the measurements up to two years and we saw the signature of clusters of 21 atoms. You add one atom and, and the STZ is slower by about a factor of 10. Um, and the kinetic window, of course, is determined by how long you measure or how, uh, or high, how high your time resolution is for fast processes. Um, so this was a very exciting result. Um, a simple experiment shows the discrete nature of the material, the atomistic nature of it. Um, the question is, um, is it also useful? What can we uh, uh, use this for? 
So um, I'll just mention briefly, I don't have time to discuss the details. We were able to model uh, C sub n, so the volume fraction, uh, as a function of number of atoms using the free volume theory uh, with Poisson statistics. Um, but now the results are relevant to anything that involves atomic transport, creep or diffusion, for example. And you can also extrapolate the viscosity to predict the glass transition temperature when the material flows. And in fact, uh, we did that and we get a result that's consistent with experimental observation. Um, and I should just mention that the glass transition is something that theorists have been pursuing for a long time. Um, so now, what about atomic transport? So if n naught is the maximum size of active STZs, if you go to higher temperature, then larger STZs can overcome their barrier as well. Um, in order to get long range diffusion, you need the STZs, their concentration to exceed the percolation threshold. Now, um, in order to get homogeneous flow, that is not sufficient. You also need that the volume fraction that's stiff, that doesn't contain uh, active potential STZs, it has to be below the percolation threshold. Now, I mentioned long range diffusion. What about short range diffusion? So, Many years ago, when I was a postdoc, I measured short range diffusion in amorphous alloys. And I saw two different time constants, which was um, at the time we didn't quite know what that meant. Um, if you assume that STZs are the mechanism of diffusion, that can explain why you can see different time constants. First, the slowest, uh, sorry, the fast STZs flip, and that leads to some atomic mixing, and then the slower STZs flip as well. And that explains very well what we saw many years ago. Um, okay, um, here's a theoretical concept about um, generally non-equilibrium materials, uh, the, the so-called energy landscape model. So if you plot the free energy as a function of all the coordinates, so if you have n atoms, it'll be three n uh, coordinates. Here, of course, schematically just two coordinates. So a crystal is at the minimum, uh, that's stable equilibrium, but you also have many local minima uh, that are not the absolute minimum and those correspond to metastable states. So if you look at a cut through this surface, let's say you form a glass here, over time it can age and slowly in a thermally activated fashion uh, evolve to a lower energy state. You can also rejuvenate it and I'll discuss later how that's done. By uh, and, and then you bring it to a higher energy state. And as you see, the crystal has the lowest uh, energy. Um, yeah, and so the rate of these processes is thermal, it's thermally activated, so it increases with temperature. Um, now, what does structural relaxation or aging do? The material becomes denser and um, then, oh, Okay, so uh, yeah, the rate of that process uh, increases with temperature. Um, anything that relies on atomic, atomic transport slows down significantly and the material becomes stiffer, okay? And it beca can become brittle as well. Rejuvenation is the opposite um, and it can be done by deformation, by radiation or by temperature cycling um, between extreme temperatures. Um, now, Generally, people have described the state of the glass with a single parameter that's measurable, for example, density or stored energy, but it turns out that uh, it's more complicated, as you'll see. Um, so an experimental technique that's often used uh, to characterize materials, uh, internal friction, you drive a material with a cyclic stress and you measure the response. And so the modulus has a real and imaginary part, and the imaginary part is a measure of dissipation. Um, and here you see the loss modulus on a log scale as a function of frequency for many different or four different glasses. And you see some of them have, uh, so they all have a peak um, and uh, it's, they're normalized to have a peak at the same frequency. Um, and you see a secondary peak for some of them only or not the other, it's called the beta relaxation. Um, and it's been observed very extensively in polymers where it's easy to explain. It's less obvious how to explain it in atomic glasses. Now, why are we interested in it? Because uh, it, it has been postulated or based on some observations that materials with a distinct beta relaxation are also more ductile, which is of course what we want if we want a tough material. Um, so what we wanted to do is look at these materials and study their STZ properties uh, in order to explain ductility. 
Um, so what we see here is strain as a function of time with the cantilever method and the mandrel bending method. Um, and this is material subjected to different aging times before beginning the bending experiment. And what you see is that as the material ages, you can put in much less anelastic strain. And you also see that they all have the same slope. So the slow process, sorry, the fast processes, they're all quite similar, but then you see different slopes at longer times, essentially after one day or so. Um, and um, so now let's take a look at the spectra. Oh yeah, one more thing. So you see that even after one year, there's a very large amount of anelastic strain. And now the question is, is it really reversible or is it permanent? How long do we have to wait to see if it's permanent or reversible? Well, since these processes are thermally activated, we take the sample to 80 degrees C for two hours and bang, it uh, recovers its original shape. So clearly it's anelastic. Um, and here are the spectra. And we see indeed the spectra are quite similar for the fast processes. And if we look at the slower processes, the main effect of aging is on the slowest peak. And what does happen? What happens to it? It moves to the right, it shifts to longer times and it decreases in intensity. Now the shift to the right, the slowing down is simply because the material becomes stiffer, the modulus becomes larger. And we verified that experimentally. Um, now, another very interesting observation here is, so we plot the volume and uh, the volume of the corresponding to each peak in the spectrum. And we see two different slopes. The error in the volume is very small because it appears in the, uh, in the exponent. And we see one slope here. It doesn't look like a big difference, but it's a difference between 0.16 and 0.26. And we can compare it to the atomic volumes. And it turns out this slope corresponds to the two smaller atoms whereas this slope corresponds to the alloy average. Um, so this is of course averaged information. We don't know whether we have mesoscopic uh, domains with different compositions or just the local fluctuation where the SDZ forms. Um, but, but this was, um, and, and in fact, heterogeneity of metallic glasses is a big uh, subject these days. Um, now, Let's take a look. We wanted to also see the effect of rejuvenation. So before we saw the effect of aging and we compared two different alloys which only differ in their copper versus nickel component, 15%. The rest is the same. And nickel and copper are not that different in their properties. And so first of all, we see the copper-based alloy has much higher anelastic strain, greater than the elastic equilibrium elastic strain. Again, we see that with aging, again, the aging takes place prior to the bending experiment. You can put in less anelastic strain. And here is an alloy with intermediate aging time that was also subjected to 10 cycles between liquid nitrogen and, and room temperature. And it looks like it fits right in. The trend seems to be quite well preserved. But let's take a look at the spectrum. Again, this is reversible, which we confirmed by annealing. Um, and here are the spectra. So again, we see for these two alloys that the slowest peak shifts and decreases in intensity. Um, we, you see here two, two samples for each uh, set of conditions, and that shows you the reproducibility of the experiment. Um, and now let's take a look at the uh, sample that was also cryogenically cycled before doing the bending experiment. And what do we see? The peak position is recovered, but the peak height is not recovered. In other words, the material becomes less stiff, the modulus decreases, uh, which we also confirmed experimentally, but the number of potential STZs indicated by the area of the peak is not recovered. And here you see that relaxation and rejuvenation clearly cannot be captured by a single parameter. The details are much more complicated. Um, but this explains in part what rejuvenation does to this material. Um, and, and by the way, it's been shown to restore ductility. Um, so now the next step is what effect does it have on the ductility of the sample, the, the substituting nickel versus copper. So here again, we see the same spectra as before. We see that the nickel-based alloy has a much more intense um, beta relaxation. This is a linear scale and log scale would be amplified. Um, and it has a lower peak here. So it's reversed between nickel and copper. And let's take a look at stress strain curves performed at different uh, uh, rates. So this is a constant extension rate. And we see the copper based alloy is much more ductile. You can stretch it 
16% before it fails. The nickel-based alloy fails after a few percent. Um, and of course it varies if you apply a lower rate, uh, you can get a bit more ductility. So clearly the uh, hypothesis that higher beta relaxation means more plasticity is incorrect. But what we do see is that the more ductile alloy has an overall higher area under the spectrum. And that's easy to explain why that. So if you have more potential STZs, you subject the material to a constant extension rate, the STZs can keep up with the applied uh, uh, strain rate. Whereas in the nickel-based alloys, they cannot, and then it fails catastrophically. So uh, I believe this is for the first time an explanation that ties STZs and STZ properties with observed mechanical behavior. Um, and, um, and now it's up to uh, hopefully in the future simulations to explain how nickel and copper play different roles uh, in these properties that we characterized. Um, now, just very briefly, um, I, all our experiments were in the linear regime, but you cannot determine gamma in the linear regime because you can only get the product of gamma times the volume. Gamma is the transformation strain. And we use the number from the physical analogs. Um, so we did a bending experiments with a mandrel that's two millimeters in radius. It's very difficult to measure curvature. So we use this well-defined geometry that's illustrated here. And here you see the strain um, as a function of the elastic strain, a measure of the stress. Here's the linear regime, and here you see the nonlinear data points. We're able to fit them. This is now on a log scale. And we obtain independently that gamma is 0.18 uh, versus 0.2, which we used in analyzing the earlier experiments. Um, again, the error bars on this are quite low. Why is this important? So there was a paper actually written, um, uh, co one co-author is uh, my own uh, doctoral advisor, where they assumed that the transformation strain is equal to the measured macroscopic yield strain, which is only 3.6%. Um, now this is clearly incorrect because for example, in a crystalline material, the strain at the core of a dislocation is much higher than the observed macroscopic strain. And this led to an artifact in analyzing a bunch of experiments where people obtained STZs that consist of hundreds, up to 800 um, atoms in uh, fairly uh, prestigious journals. Uh, but this is clearly incorrect. Um, then, uh, so that's one important result that we obtained um, beyond the, the previous results. Um, we can't measure the temperature dependence we, because we, our measurements are long term. You have to come back and take a uh, snapshot. But we used literature data for the loss modulus. We fitted it with the same model that we applied to our uh, quasi static data. And here you see the spectra. Again, we see peaks. And from those peaks, we can um, obtain the time constants and we can simultaneously, it doesn't look like a great fit, but consider that these were all fitted simultaneously. Uh, this regime is above the glass transition when the material flows. And basically we see a reuse plot, namely the time constant as a function of temp inverse temperature for clusters of 25 up to 33 atoms. So this proves the temperature dependence as modeled in, in Ali Argon's uh, theory. And um, yeah, there, there, there's some more details above the glass transition temperature, which I, I won't go into in the interest of time. Um, and that concludes my talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Well, well while waiting... Okay. okay, go ahead. Okay. I had a question about like um, the, def the definition of aging and the yeah. other term. So you said that the other uh, phenomena is related to irradiation. And um, from, from my understanding that the radiation like makes the material more hard and that is related to higher uh, elastic moduli, right? So I'm just like confused because aging is related to higher moduli. And in the, in the same time, the irradiation hardening is is causing a, a more hard material as well. So I don't get okay. confused between uh, the two phenomena. Okay, so um, yeah, irradiation of metallic glasses causes rejuvenation. It causes a uh, decrease in modulus and, uh, and decrease in density. 
Um, but I'm not sure I, I understood the second part of your. So maybe m maybe the radiation hardening is right, right, like um, related to to metals or something. Maybe for the glasses because they are disordered, so radiation like makes things together. I don't know. Maybe the radiation effect on the glasses is different than what. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, that's an important point. So in crystalline materials. Uh, you form defects which inhibit dislocation motion. So if a dislocation gets mm -hmm. in between two points that are close together, it requires higher stress to make it uh, blow out and, 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 and therefore yeah. uh, for the material to deform. So, so yeah, this radiation hardening phenomenon is not uh, common with, um, uh, it does not uh, happen to my best knowledge in amorphous materials. And in fact, that's, um, in a way, it may be analogous to what I said before, that crystalline materials work hard and you deform them, they become harder. And mm -hmm. uh, whereas an amorphous material becomes softer when you deform it. I see, okay, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. I, uh, I have a question. So um, first of all, thank you for your inspiring uh, presentation. So I have a question about this, the production of the, of the spectrum. So. Can you, uh, I, so I didn't quite get it, uh, how, uh, how do you produce those spectrum and uh, is that always unique solution? Oh, yeah, excellent question. Let me go back um, and ha have that. Um... And in fact, uh, Professor Esmond, that is my question as well. So doing the inverse Laplace transform it's uh, not easy. I don't know if you yeah, yeah. You um, applied any like regularizer to stabilize the. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Th thanks for the question. L let me see. Um, I'm sure, I'll show the slide with that um, image. Um, yeah, th this is it. So, yeah. Um, so these are the expressions we fit. And initially we did not use a regularizer. So basically for everybody's benefit, uh, it, in order to get physical solutions, you don't want them to vary very uh, in extreme ways to have large oscillations. So in the fit, you introduce a term that you want to minimize along with other terms um, that's sensitive to large variations. So to the gradient, for example. Um, so initially we didn't use it. And for example, this result was obtained without it. And the only um, support we obtained for the, uh, that, that led us to believe that this is real is simply that we applied the method to a simulated data where we knew what the input spectrum was and we were able to recover it. Um, then we, we found that there's actually a stand standard. So we wrote the software for that without knowing what's out there. And then it turns out there is software for these sort of fits, which has a term, a regularizing term. And we varied that term until we got consistent uh, results where the results were not sensitive to that term. So the, the weight of the regularizer. And, um, and then we obtained, so for a series of samples, we wanted to see the same regularizing term and uh, result that's insensitive to it. Uh, and that's how we obtained it. But um, the, the, so yeah, whenever you solve an inverse problem, you don't have a guarantee that, uh, of uniqueness. But um, when we vary the conditions, we use different numbers of exponents or we use different ranges in which to fit. And we always obtained consistent results. Um, and uh, of course, if the data didn't have any noise, um, you, you could get very nice data. Noise is what kills these kind of fits. And that's true in um, tomography and, and as well, of course. Um, and, so and I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's uh, yeah, th thank you. But so, but um, does the initial condition, initial guess matters? Um, no, uh, yeah, thank you. We, we also tested different initial guesses, absolutely. Yeah, I see. so, so basically any input parameter that's somewhat arbitrary, we tried to vary it and it took us uh, more than half a year before we, um, from the time we got these spectra until we had confidence that uh, they were real. Uh, so at, at first we didn't believe them. That is amazing, thank you. Thanks. And, and the consistency between different systems is reassuring. Um, yeah, and the fact that the dynamic data uh, from internal friction um, worked, it's harder to do the fits for dynamic data, but um, uh, so the, the scatter was somewhat larger as you saw, but yeah, that, that was uh, also a, a reassuring confirmation. Yeah, thanks.
Okay, any other questions? Uh, thank you, Professor, for giving this interesting presentation. I have a question. So in your master, you use uh, mostly the, the strain as a function of time. Yeah. So uh, maybe you have done that. Have you, have you tried to use this method to, to, to fit the, the stress relaxation data, the stress as a function of time? And uh, um, Well, that would require an instrumented measurement. Um, and what we do here is we simply, so for most of the range, we simply look at, um, at the curvature as a function of time. We just come back to the lab and take a snapshot, making sure that the camera is aligned relative to the plane of the sample and so you don't get a parallax. Um, so that, that sort of thing. And so we did the uh, nano indenture measurements. Um, of course here, um, yeah, we, we used the fixed force. So yeah, we weren't able to use the same boundary conditions, which is why these two expressions are different. But um, yeah, it would be nice to uh, do different kinds of measurements, but, but doing them for up to a year or two, that would be difficult. Um, so the, the nice thing about this is it's not instrumented, so it's not dependent on the stability of any sensitive instrument for, for the long-term measurements. Um, I don't know if that yeah. answers your question. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, very yes, nice. Maybe you can we directly apply this method to, to the stress relaxation data we, we already have, right? Um, then yeah, if, yeah, if you have stress relaxation data, um, yeah, I'd, um, I'd be glad to look at them and, uh, and see w what kind of uh, measurements. Uh, so, so they're just time dependent uh, relaxation at fixed strain and, and monitoring the stress. Yeah, fixed strain and the, the time evolution. With, yeah. yeah, it should be possible. It's of course, you know, each such, uh, it's a different boundary condition. So you have to adjust the, uh, the expression. Yes, because the, the, the stress relaxation data measured by dynamic and mechanical analyzer seems to, uh, m seems more accurate than your st strain uh, evolution data. So maybe uh, when apply the method to the stress relaxation data, we will we'll get more Accurate spectral of the yeah you're power. probably right but but not uh, it's probably um, not so easy to do measurements up to a year or two um, on the DMA right yes yes yeah but uh, yeah you're right we can, uh, we can higher temperature right yeah with the DMA you of course can control the temperature as well which we don't have for this experiment only for the literature data that we um, um, that that we fitted the uh, uh, dynamic uh, data yes. Yeah. Okay, very nice. Uh, any more questions? Okay, um, well, I have a lot of questions, but I think I'll, I'll probably ask you <laughs> later on. For okay, sure. yeah. okay, well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to Professor Eismar again, and thank you all for attention. Well, it was a pleasure to visit virtually. Thank you. Hopefully we can bring you to campus sometime. That'd be wonderful. Okay, thanks again. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye, Bye everybody.